airspace diseases. Okay, uh, we are technically talking about airspace diseases here in the sense uh, most of the times pneumonias, right, and alveolar uh, kind of conditions. Uh, you see here, uh, the answer is technically lobar pneumonia and alveolar edema. And then we are talking about bronchopneumonia and aspiration uh, pneumonitis. Uh, generally speaking, we, uh, that is the correct answer here, lobar pneumonia and alveolar edema, bronchopneumonia and aspiration pneumonitis. Uh, you see here, the pulmonary interstitial edema, it is obviously talking about the interstitial uh, contents, which is a connective tissue, so that's the reason it is not. COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, though yes, it belongs to airspace diseases, but uh, a combination of pulmonary interstitial edema and COPD is a classical presentation. Uh, so the answer could not be, you know, uh, uh, pulmonary interstitial edema. And then bronchogenic carcinoma and metastasis. Bronchogenic carcinoma and metastasis, both of them. Bronchogenic carcinoma, yes, is an airspace disease, but metastasis is not an airspace disease. It is related down to interstitium. Okay. Tuberculosis and sarcoidosis. Tuberculosis and sarcoidosis are both interstitial diseases. So that's the reason we are uh, uh, that's the reason we are not actually choosing this one. So the correct answer to this question is uh, lobar pneumonia, alveolar edema. And then uh, bronchopneumonia and aspiration uh, pneumonitis is the correct answer. Airspace diseases, in the sense, we are going to look for the diseases that are presenting down into alveoli. Okay, so uh, uh, it is a fairly a very simple question when compared uh, to the others, right? Okay, the second question here. Okay. The second question here, we have got uh, diffuse, fluffy, hazy confluence opacities distributed along the lung fields. Okay, uh, here you see, uh, this is uh, technically a little bit of a tricky question. Okay, uh, we need to know how exactly we are going to differentiate uh, the uh, answers that have been given here. Uh, first thing you see here, diffuse. Diffuse in the sense it is going to appear down in both the lung fields. Fluffy, okay? Fluffy in the sense uh, they look like cotton balls or something. Hazy, they do not have a well demarcated borders. Confluence, they are occurring down as groups, okay? And which are present all over the lung fields. So such kind of a characteristic feature is generally happening if something is going to happen with alveoli, yes or no? Lobular pneumonia, yes? Lobular pneumonia is some kind of a condition which actually also can cause such kind of an opacities, right? So which is much more closer to alveolar, uh, uh, alveolar condition here, pulmonary alveolar edema is the one that actually has got a better appearance and got a better relation to this one. Uh, but the COPD, COPD generally will not show hazy confluence opacities because COPD will be showing up, uh, you know, uh, traction bronchiectasis and will be showing up, uh, uh, you know, uh, air spaces that have been completely inflated. They will be hypodensities, but they will not be hyperdensities. Okay. Tuberculosis, yes, tuberculosis will be showing up as uh, GONS focus, uh, rank is complex with lymphadenopathies, and also they are going to show down the granulomatous like reactions and they are confined down to only single lobes of the segments. Unless it is uh, interstitial in pattern, it is not going to come down into middle lobes and lower lobes, uh, which will be actually showing up as uh, fibrosis, uh, pleural effusions and other things. So tuberculosis also out of the option. Empyema, empyema in the sense, okay, empyema is a clinical condition where there will be, you know, uh, the formation of pus inside the pleural cavity. So that one is outside the lung fields. Uh, so we that is also not a big deal of an option. Even if it is empyema shows up and, uh, you know, opacification, but that one will be well demarcated and it will be having either be on unilateral and it is more on the dependent parts. So the situation is here when we are talking about defeat diffuse fluffy hazy confluence of opacities which means to say we are talking about perihilar densities 
which is a characteristic feature of pulmonary alveolar edema okay so this is uh, technically not you know very difficult uh, uh, question it is quite easy uh, if you have got this answer correct here you have to understand this one this kind of distribution is uh, you know generally a very very classical feature of bat wings edema as well right diffuse fluffy hazy confluence of opacities distributed uh, along the lung fields originating from center to the periphery okay so such kind of distribution is generally which is nothing but your bat wings edema which is a characteristic feature of pulmonary edema right so can you correlate this uh, to the pulmonary edema condition there yes no i don't know how many of you people has got one this uh, this one wrong here but uh, the more of answer here is pulmonary alveolar edema this one can also be classically interpreted down as also bat wings edema okay right is there any uh, uh, you know uh, doubt in this question here yes or no guys right perfect so the next one you see here uh, this one is technically a uh, definition that kind of have been asked the phenomenon of air filled bronchi okay uh, dark arrow here you see here this one right and being made uh, visible by opacification of surrounding alveoli okay the phenomenon of air filled bronchi which means to say that air filled bronchi has to appear black okay something like appearing black now that is made visible by the opacification of the surrounding alveoli okay the surrounding alveoli are the ones that are looking white okay so such kind of a pattern it is a very very classical definition such kind of classical definition is always happening in an air bronchogram pattern okay uh, remember if it is uh, a mosaic pattern generally it will not look like this mosaic pattern actually looks uh, very hazy and uh, it will be actually uh, showing up a much more uh, you know uh, square like hypodensities here ground glass opacities ground glass opacities will have paraseptal thickenings and uh, uh, you know traction bronchiectasis and it is happening more in the periphery so it can be a ground glass opacity cavitation cavitation has to have a thin wall okay and it has to have uh, you know a hypodensity that is present down within a thin wall okay which is a characteristic feature of most of tuberculosis patients right so it is not cavitation cavitation is confined cavitation do not have bronchuses involved in with them Reticular nodular pattern. Reticular nodular pattern is generally a characteristic feature of interstitial lung diseases. So they have to show down as uh, dots and lines. Okay, if somebody has chosen reticular nodular pattern here, generally it is not uh, because reticular nodular pattern does not form a homogeneous hyperdensity. So the only option that is left out here is a bronchogram pattern. The way how how we actually recognize the air bronchogram pattern is that you have you can actually see the main branch of the bronchus okay the pr primary branches from the uh, bronchial tree will originate and they will be appearing patent when they are patent okay when there is no such kind of obstruction that is present within this bronchus what you can generally see is that okay they will be completely black but eventually there has been filled up of uh, you know fluid or edematic uh, fluid or this is a presence of uh, pus inside the alveoli supplied by that bronchus generally this is a characteristic feature of pneumonia okay but uh, every air bronchogram pattern doesn't necessarily mean to say it is a pneumonia but it is a typical uh, examination what we actually do uh, observation we make here uh, any kind of an air filled bronchi, okay, appearing down as a radiolucent streak like density within the surrounding opacification. So, such kind of a thing is called as an air bronchogram pattern, okay, which is uh, quite typical. You have to uh, 
uh, remember uh, the definition here for sure. Okay. So how many of you people still don't understand what is an air bronchogram pattern? Right. Yes, no. Okay. Then the next question. Okay, you see here, this is uh, quite uh, simple. We, are t we have been talking about uh, a silo design, which is quite classical. Okay, I have been repeating and repeating this question for a long, long time. Okay, whenever I'm saying that the right heart border is not clear, and it is siloted while the diaphragm shadow is clear. Okay, that one will be happening because of the silo design, which is anatomically related structure that is present there will be a consolidation or an opacification that is present down in the right middle lobe. Okay, do not ever forget the silo design uh, interpretations. Okay, if the superior vena cava is uh, obscured. Superior vena cava shadow is obscured. Uh, the uh, opacification will be present down in the right upper lobe. Okay, if the right heart border is not seen, it will be present down in the right middle lobe. If the diaphragmatic shadow is not seen, it is present down in the right lower lobe. If the aortic knob uh, shadow is not seen, it will be present down in the left upper lobe. Uh, if it is uh, the F atrial shadow is not shown, or if the left ventricular shadow is not shown, uh, it will be present down in the lingular segment. And if it is happening on the left side of the diaphragm is being obscured, it is, will be present down in the left lower lobe. So do not ever forget these landmarks, uh, which when we are trying to apply down a Silotis sign, okay? Silotis sign can be technically defined as, you know, uh, when the two edges, uh, when the two edges of uh, any structures are being blurred, uh, it will be happening because of the pathology that is present down in the anatomically related structure. Okay, when an anatomical structure's edge has been blurred out due to some opacification, they start to appear crazy, uh, hazy. Then, what actually, uh, the fact you have to understand here that the anatomically related structure present is the one having the pathology, but not the structures whose uh, borders have been obscured. So this is actually application of the silo design and the classical example always we have to remember down is the if the right heart border is not clear and the diaphragmatic shadow is clear which means to say the problem is present down in the right middle lobe itself the answer is not both a and c uh, generally you see here a mass present down in the right lower lobe uh, it actually depends on the type of the mass. Okay, if it is three centimeters mass, actually it will be looking well demarcated, but it may not be able to, you know, completely obscure the shadow of the right heart border. Maybe a little one, but a complete ob obscuration of the right heart border will eventually lead down to a problem that is present down in the right middle lobe. Okay, so the answer to this question is not technically A and C. You cannot, okay, a mass present down in the right lower lobe can also behave like that one. But uh, complete obscuration has to happen to apply the silo design. So the answer will be C, consolidation in the right middle lobe. OK. So uh, how many people still do not understand what is a silo design? Is it clear or is there any doubt about this one? Right. What about other guys? Uh, I see there are 24 people or so. OK, who uh, I guess uh, you guys uh, take part into the conversations. OK, please don't just be listening and listening. All right. OK. Right. If you got this uh, question wrong, I think maybe your concepts about uh, silo design are not uh, clear at all. So you have to, you know, continue again revising the silo design right okay this one is uh, technically a very interesting question okay uh, this one uh, you need not 
you know, there is nothing big of a logic here, uh, but uh, the answer has to be by hearted. Uh, the most common cause of uh, community acquired pneumonia okay the most common cause of community acquired pneumonia will be varicella pneumonia and streptococcus pneumonia okay there is no other option uh, you have to remember it that way the most common cause is varicella pneumonia which is viral pneumonias and then streptococcus pneumonia bacterial pneumonia right okay but uh, you see here uh, MRSA ventilator associated pneumonias are the one that are actually the most common causes of nosocomial pneumonias. Okay, remember them ventilator associated pneumonia, MRSA. MRSA means to say methicillin resistant streptococcus aureus. Okay, right? MRSA, staph aureus. Okay, staph aureus, uh, streptococcus pneumoniae and staph aureus okay methicillin resistant staph aureus i think uh, last time also i told you the full form mrsa equals to methicillin resistant staph aureus okay uh, which is a common condition that is actually seen in nosocomial infections Nosocomial infections in the sense any kind of a pneumonia that is uh, happening down in the hospital. Okay, nosocomial means to say hospital admission. Okay, any pine, any kind of a pneumonic infection that is happening down in the you know hospitalized patients, it will be MRSA and ventilatory assisted pneumonia. Uh, if you can remember, uh, you know the Nirbhaya case, right? Uh, the, the woman who has been, uh, you know went down in the Delhi incident, if you can remember that person, okay, the person actually died of uh, MRSA, uh, but uh, it is not about due to the trauma. She was on put down on a ventilator, right? If you can remember the story, yes, she was put on a ventilator in Singapore. Well, the, actually, the cause of death in her condition was actually a serious infection of MRSA, right? So uh, nosocomial infections are quite hard to treat uh, but uh, however uh, you have to understand by the definition here is that mrsa is nothing but methicillin resistant staph aureus which means to say most of these bacteria uh, generally are completely resistant down to all kind of penicillins okay and uh, what kind of a drug will you use to treat here uh, mrsa anybody have an idea uh, this may not be related down to radiology, but still, I guess uh, you should know about that one. If there is an MRSA infection, what is the choice of drug? What is the drug you actually uh, use to treat it? Okay, Aman, yes, you are correct. MRSA is treated by vancomycin but uh, there is an also another complication thing which is actually called as vrsa vrsa is nothing but vancomycin vancomycin resistant staph aureus as well okay staph aureus dinosin yes okay uh Vancomycin resistant staph aureus. Okay, this is also another separate strain of this bacteria which gets more resistant as well. So, if there is an uh, vancomycin resistant staph aureus infection, what are you going to treat it with? Anybody have an idea? BRSA. Okay, there are two types of nosocomial infections one is MRSA and BRSA. Both of them are very, very hard to treat and they are the leading, uh, leading causes of death in a hospital patients with comorbidities, okay? Uh, VRSA, yes, uh, you can also treat them with metronidazole. Remember, the drug of choice for MRSA is vancomycin, okay? And VRSA, it will be metronidazole, okay? Yes, so I think uh, ventilatory-assisted pneumonia, Okay, ventilatory assisted pneumonia and MRSA are the causes of nosocomial infection. 
So what is the most common condition for community acquired pneumonia? Okay, is varicella pneumonia or streptococcus pneumonia? Okay, this one uh, varicella pneumonia is more common in children. Streptococcus pneumonia is more common in adults. Okay, uh, just you have to by heart. There is no other way. You have to remember these names. Okay, the next question. You see here the same thing what we asked in the first question itself. Okay, fluffy pattern of bilateral perihilar shadowing. Okay, fluffy pattern, hazy pattern of bilateral perihilar shadowing distribution from center to the periphery, which actually looks down as the bat wings. Okay, it is nothing but the same question. Okay, what is the first question? This is also the same question, but it is a different interpretation. So which will be happening because of cardiogenic pulmonary edema? Do not ever forget this uh, answer here. Batwing's appearance is always, always a classical feature of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. When we are talking about pulmonary alveolar edema, there are two types of conditions, right? One is cardiogenic and other is non-cardiogenic, okay? Cardiogenic will also typically show up as batwing sign, but uh, uh, Non-cardiogenic generally will not show bat wing sign, but will be showing only perihilar shadows, but they will not be really high dense uh, like uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, okay? They will not show up the same pattern like that. So that's the reason, okay, you can, you, your brain has to strike whenever I'm talking about bat wing sign. Yes, it is a typical characteristic feature of cardiogenic pulmonary edema, okay? You can't make a mistake about this question here. It is always, always cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It is not lobular pneumonia. Lobular pneumonia generally will not show, you know, uh, central distribution, central to peripheral distribution. Okay, they will be showing up only peripheral distributions. COPD, COP, uh, COPD generally also will not show. It is not fluffy pattern. Okay, COPD is entirely different from this one. Okay, so B and C, the confusion might occur between B and C. Lobular pneumonia, yes, also can show it. Uh, but lobular pneumonia, generally I'm talking about here, non-cardiogenic alveolar edema. Yes, they also show fluffy pattern. They also show, uh, you know, central to peri uh, mostly peripheral appearance. Okay, mostly peripheral. And, uh, you know, they also happen down as very high large shadows, okay, in, you know, early cases. But it uh, doesn't matter which one is early or the chronic. Cardiogenic pulmonary edema will eventually and always, always show a batwing sign. And along with the batwing sign in these cases, you will be also looking at the curly B lines, okay? So how can we actually make a confirmatory diagnosis of this one cardiogenic pulmonary edema? You will have one a bat wings pattern you see here this is the bat wings pattern and you will be also looking at the curly lines okay this x-ray we do not actually appreciate the curly lines as well but uh, you know remember both of them uh, will eventually uh, show the same situation it is always cardiogenic the other evidence if we don't know the answer is that okay if you want to try to differentiate it with, between cardiac pulmonary edema or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, when you are actually struggling between them, you always look at the shadow of the heart. The shadow of the heart, okay, cardiomegaly should not be present, okay? If the cardiomegaly is present, it means to say you're talking or dealing about a case with congestive heart failures, okay? Uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failures, chamber enlargements are the cases that you have been dealing here. So uh, generally it indicates, yes, it is a case of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Look at this place here. You are eventually looking at a very, very big heart whose cardiothoracic ratio is more than 58. Okay, so obviously we are dealing a case of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. This is a classical example. Please do not forget this one. Okay. Anybody who has a doubt, who, can, who cannot differentiate between cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edemas? Right, okay. For most of the people you see here, I can see actually for all the people uh, who have been, you know, participating here, I guess uh, you guys got almost uh, 
hundred percent answers correct. Okay, I don't know about other people. Uh, I have because I have seen most of the people have performed really very very well uh, in this exam. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you have actually chosen your answers uh, by you know following up your notes and following up and without seeing the notes. If you have done the exam that way, yes, you have done a very very good paper. But if you have been looking down into the notes and if you have been writing the answers with the help of the book, I think maybe, yes, you need to practice more so that you cannot uh, do a mistake in the main exam. OK, my suggestion is, OK, whenever you are having the exams here, you have a flexibility of opening down the books and referring whenever you are wrong. That's the reason, you know, most of the people have been submitting the answers, even if they know the correct answers as well. But uh, try to do most of the times without the books. Right. OK, then let's go to the next question. Uh, I don't know how many of you people actually, you know, got it wrong. I don't want to take names here. Uh, I guess most of the people actually got this uh, one as, uh, you know, uh, wrong. Uh, but you see here, this is a multiple choice question. The pattern actually that is shown down in the circle. OK, we can actually see there are smaller, smaller opacities here. OK, small, small opacities along with. You know, uh, lines patterns. OK, this one is actually a very, very classical example. OK, where you have smaller opacities along with the hazy. Live like densities, OK, that are distributed along the lung fields. So this one is a typical pattern of an interstitial lung disease, which is called as a reticulonodular pattern. If you have answered this question correct, I think maybe there is another one of the fill in the blanks, which will also let you mark it correct, right? So uh, people who ever had a, made a mistake here in this question, but still were able to, you know, uh, write down the answer to the fill in the blank. Do not remember, uh, do not forget about how a reticulonodular pattern actually looks like. OK, remember, there are examples down in your practical slides. There are examples down in the theoretical slides as well. So remember, this is a reticulonodular pattern. OK. It's a simple question. Uh, this is a basic lesion. Right. OK, now this is also very uh, fairly a very, very easy question. You just goes by the definition as simple as that small millet like okay greater than one mm opacities diffused all over the lung fields is a characteristic feature of yes it is a characteristic feature of always miliary tb do not forget this appearance either okay it is a it is a nodular pattern okay it is a nodular interstitial disease it is not reticular nodular pattern this one is a nodular pattern okay which will be showing up opacities greater than one mm. OK, all the lung fields has got smaller dots like things, small one mm dots. OK, the, if it, you look down into the CT scan, OK, this one will be small millet like densities. You can appreciate it here. This is always, always a characteristic feature of miliary TB. And miliary TB is the hematogenous spread complication. OK. If it is uh, spreading down through alveoli and if it is spreading down through lymphatics, yes, it will be having another pattern which will be fibrosis, pleural effusion, pneumothoraces, cavitations, etc. But this one in particular, miliary TB is a hematogenously spreading TB manifestation. Okay, it is also a complication of TB, but usually this one is happening because of the hematogenous spread. Well, whereas if it is uh, happening because of lymphatic spread, it will be having pleural effusions, fibrosis, cavitation, and interstitial changes. So remember this classical differentiation. Whenever you are asked to write about uh, TB, you do not ignore this characteristic feature. It is a very, very classical feature. It is asked most of the times in many, many competitive examinations. Yes, miliary TB is nothing but small, uh, you know, millet like one mm opacities diffused all over the lung fields. OK, so is there any kind of confusion in differentiating this one or recognizing this one? 
see, even if we give the X-ray of this person, even if we don't give the X-ray of this condition, you know, you should not be able to miss down the answer to this question. It's quite important, okay? The only takeaway uh, point here, what you have to remember is that it happens because of the hematogenous spread. It is an extra, uh, it is a pulmonary complication, okay, which happens down due to the, uh, you know, uh, conditions of extra pulmonary tuberculosis uh, of hematogenous spread, okay? Right? The same way, this one is also going to cause millet like shadows on the liver, which is also happening because of tuberculosis, okay? Uh, hepatic tuberculosis is also one uh, possible. Intestinal tuberculosis is also possible. All those conditions, all these patients with miliary tuberculosis will eventually go down with extra pulmonary manifestations as well. So it will be uh, more likely to spread down in the all other parts of the body as well. Okay, right? So any confusion to with this question? Yes, no? Okay, right. The next question, this is fairly a very, very simple question. Whoever got this one wrong, I guess, yeah, you have to, you know, take your own priorities. See, true about left lung, true about left lung is that, okay, it has got medial and lateral segments. Is that correct? No, it did not have medial and lateral segments. It has got the superior and inferior segments or the dorsal or proximal segments, right? Okay, lobes are divided by the transverse and oblique fissures. No, left lung is not divided by the transverse and oblique fissures. It is only divided by the oblique fissure, right? Size is less than the right. Okay, size is less than the right. Yes, the left lung has got the size less than the right. That is true. Uh, does the left lung has got three lobes? No, it did not have three lobes. It has got only two lobes, the upper lobe and the lower lobe. Yell. And then it has got eight upon 10 pulmonary segments. Yes, usually the lung has got 10 pulmonary segments. Okay, by the classification we learned, but uh, two of these segments uh, within the, you know, upper lobe, epical posterior segment fuses to get, uh, epical and posterior segments fuses together to form down as the epical posterior segments. And then dorsal segment, Okay, and anterior segment fuses together to form down another single segment. So both of those segments will be fused together. So final outcome, it has got only eight segments. But yes, for classification purpose, we actually call them as both 10 and 10. But uh, anatomically, they will be fused together. So that's the reason we're calling them as a single segment. So left lung has got eight pulmonary segments. Okay, its size is less than the right. So we cannot eventually make down the answer wrong for this question, okay? So whoever people got this wrong question, you know, I think you have to look down again, learn the anatomy once again, because such kind of a question will be always asked. What is the difference between the right lung and the left lung? There is no other option. Either the questions are anatomy, the questions are anatomy are coming down from the differences between the right lung and the left lung, or differences between the right bronchus and the left main bronchus, differences between the right hilum and the left hilum, differences between the right hemidiaphragm and the left hemidiaphragm. These are always, always classical questions. We cannot ignore such type of anatomical landmarks, okay? So please pay attention down to the normal pulmonary anatomy whenever you are reading down respiratory system, okay? That's a very, very important uh, point to learn. Next question, okay? The, this one is fairly, I think most of the people generally, I don't know if you can remember this one or not, but I think uh, while we are dealing about the, you know, the cases, I have been talking about a condition called as the geographic lung. Do you guys remember that one? I told you about a condition called as the geographic lung opacities, right? Or uh, plaquey lung or sclerotic lung, if you can remember. We were talking about uh, uh, a lot, uh, so many times. We have talked about this one so many times. 
Okay, the inhomogeneous hyperdensities distributed bilaterally due to hellenized collagen fibers. Okay, hallucination of collagen fibers is an indicative of a very, very classical feature. It is a very classical feature. It shows up at the geographic, uh, geographic, uh, you know, uh, lung, uh, which is a characteristic feature of asbestosis. But I think on that day also, I told you another clinical pointer. I asked you a question, okay, what is a geographic tongue? In which disease shall we see a geographic tongue? Geographic tongue. Can anybody remember? I have mentioned it that day. This is geographic lung, right? Okay, there is another condition which also appears the same like this on the tongue itself. Okay. So, can anybody tell me what is the answer for geographic tongue? Geographic tongue is seen in which condition? You see, generally, it, it is not related to radiology. It is related to dermatology. And uh, I think, yes, uh, there are some paragraphs uh, in Robin's textbook also that talks about this one. Actually, it's a form of candida albicans. Okay, candida infection, candida albicans. Okay, which is happening because of oral thrush. Okay, oral thrush. That is the condition, that is the clinical condition where there will be a condition, uh, where there will be an appearance called as geographic tongue. Okay, this is geographic lung. Geographic lung is a characteristic feature of asbestosis. Remember, geographic tongue happens down in candida albicans. Okay, infection of the tongue, mouth, oral thrush. We call it as water brash also. We call it as water brash as well. Okay, this clinical condition is called as water brash too. Okay, so remember them. Uh, it is yeah, maybe some for your competitive exams, it might be, you know, helpful. All right. Do not forget uh, this kind of appearance. Okay. Right. Uh, fairly, maybe, I think, uh, let me try to actually, uh, you know, clear some of your doubts here. Um, okay. Can somebody tell me what is this Cartagener syndrome? I think I also told you about this condition. But I guess most of you people don't remember this one. What is this Cartagena syndrome? Maybe I think, you know, Indian guys has to, you know, certainly, certainly remember this syndrome snake. Because most of the doctors always, always wanted to ask you a question about this one. Cartagena syndrome. Can anybody remember? I think I already told you that definition there. Can anybody remember what is Cartagena syndrome? Autosomal disorder, yes, that is fine. Autosomal recessive disorder. Mm, nah, it is not due to bronchiectasis. It is actually a combination of cystic, okay, combination of cystic pulmonary, okay, fibrosis, okay, with ciliary dis motility okay defects in the cilia yes yes ankita yes you are correct pulmonary cystic pulmonary fibrosis along with ciliary dysmotility this is an autosomal disorder you know what actually happens is that in this condition all the cilia that have been present down in the body you know generally they start to you know uh, they start to dysfunction so all the organs, whichever needs cilia for their function, okay, microsvilli or the, you know, the cilia that has been present down in the trachea, okay, where else do we have cilia in our body? Anybody? Clara, Benedict, any idea? Where else do we have cilia in our body? No. Here we have hair in them. Hair is technically not cilia exactly. I'm talking about the microscopic level, okay? Bronchus, yes, bronchus has cilia. Okay, that's the reason this person will be having cystic pulmonary fibrosis. That's true. Jejunum, okay? Where else? Where else do we have cilia? Mm. 
perfect. Okay, zona pellucida, ovaries, yes, cilia. Then? No, that cilia you are talking about, uh, the fallopian tubules, you are talking about the ampullous things, right? No, no, they, they are not technically cilia, okay? Nostrils, yes, okay. No, all the lining of the respiratory system is having cilia. Okay, don't worry. Uh, Benedict and Shabi, yes, you are. You guys are correct. The whole lining of the, uh, you know, the respiratory system is made up of cilia itself. So yes, uh, beat nostril, beat bronchus. Yes, you guys are correct. But where else do we have cilia? Ankita, can you tell it? Aman, can you tell where else are cilia? Okay, remember, this is a very, very classical disease. Okay, Indian teachers actually love to ask this question a lot of times. Sperms have the cilia, yes or no? Every sperm has got a tail to them, right? Okay, so these people with Cartagena syndrome are infertile. The person presenting up with the pulmonary cystic fibrosis, okay, and respiratory distress, and also complains of oligospermia along with infertility. It is called as Cartagena syndrome, okay? Remember, do not ever forget this disease. It is very, very important for competitive exams. So Cartagena syndrome is a problem that is present down with pulmonary cystic fibrosis, protein B deficiency, along with, because the protein B is the one that actually, you know, uh, you know, enhances the function of cilia. So because these people will be having this deficiency, okay, it is in biochemistry, I think you have, you should have learned about this one. Did you guys heard this name there? Okay, protein B, protein C, Pneumocytes, production, ciliary production. Okay, did you did you heard this one? It it might be coming down in you know protein metabolism. Okay, that is the place where you will be actually listening it for the first time. Cartagena syndrome is characterized by pulmonary cystic fibrosis along with ciliary dysmotility and infertility. Okay, this is a very very classical presentation. It is a triad. Remember, that is called as Cartagena syndrome, okay? Right? There are three clinical conditions involved in this one, okay? Right. And uh, tuberculosis, obviously, no, it shows reticular fibrosis. Pulmonary alveolar edema, no, it will be showing up bat wing side. Pneumonia, no, it will be showing up as consolidation. So, these are not in homogeneous densities. All of them are not in homogeneous densities. This is a homogeneous density. This is an inhomogeneous density, but it is not, you know, all over diffuse and they are hyper densities, but not due to halinized collagen fibers. Okay. If it is happening because of halinized collagen fibers, yes, it will be happening because of asbestosis. Okay. And if it is actually happening because of ciliary dysmotility, it is happening because of pulmonary cystic fibrosis. So then you will be actually choosing Cartagena syndrome. So the change here in the cellular uh, uh, structure, when we call it with a different name, yes, the whole diagnosis changes. Okay, remember this one. It is an interesting case. Maybe if you have time, better go and learn about the Cartagena syndrome and what are the proteins and what are the enzymes that are actually being defective there. Which gene is being defective? I guess I, if I can remember well, I think it should be chromosome number 13 or chromosome number six. I don't exactly remember. That is the one defective gene present down in the Cartagena syndrome, right? Okay. Uh, so this one, fairly the same thing, the same bat wing edema, what we have given there also came down with the same thing here. See, there is no big difference. This is a bat wings appearance. Bat wings appearance, again, we are talking about pulmonary alveolar edema. The question is repeated like four times in this question paper itself. So people who ever made mistake all these four questions, 
which means to say you are looking down to your books but you are not grasping the concepts okay this is again a batwing sign classical batwing sign which is a characteristic feature of pulmonary alveolar edema silicosis uh, i think uh, maybe you know silica dust i think uh, let me see what is the class, scientific name for silica dust let me check once maybe this new information might be helpful to you silica dust uh scientific name uh Okay. Yeah, this is the classical name, scientific name for this one, silica. Okay. This is fairly, this is fairly a very, very big name. Okay. It's the scientific name of silicosis. Okay. This is the classical name of silica, silicosis. Okay. Generally, we don't call with this one big name, right? If you can remember this one, that is uh, fine. Sound baggage command. Sound baggage. I'm on WhatsApp. Yeah. I think if you guys have been looking down at the spelling bee computation, I think, yes, this has been used down in the spelling bee computation. You know, it is actually called as pneumono ultra microscopic silico volcanosis. That's the complete name of silicosis disease. Okay. Pneumono ultra microscopic silico volcanosis is the name, scientific name of uh, silicosis remember it that way okay silica dust it is actually happening because of silica dust well, maybe you can actually try to you know remember that one i just wanted to share that information with you right <clears throat> the next question okay this one is also a very very classical feature people cannot go wrong with this one Sign specific diagnostic characteristics of usual interstitial pneumonia, UIP. Okay, most of the people actually got this answer wrong. Okay, you have chosen only two options here, but you are ignoring one bigger thing. I think most of the people, most of the people will be actually should be, you know, you have to know, let us try to differentiate what exactly we know about this one. A bronchogram pattern and consolidations. Yes, it indicates pneumonia. So obviously this is usual interstitial pneumonia, but pneumonia, what I'm talking about air bronchogram pattern, it is an alveolar pneumonia. So it's not. Next one, honeycombing, traction bronchiectasis. Yes, this, since it is interstitial pneumonia, yes, honeycombing and traction bronchiectasis should be the characteristic feature. Next, interstitial fibrosis, peripheral septal thickenings. Yes, it is also a classical feature that is shown upon HRCT. So interstitial fibrosis and peripheral septal thickenings, yes, is a characteristic feature. And all these things, you know, interstitial fibrosis and peripheral septal thickenings together, we generally call them as ground glass opacities and reticulations on the other way. Yes or no? The same name, interstitial fibrosis and peripheral septal thickenings. Pathological process is that one. And we got a classical name for them as the ground glass opacities or the GGO or the reticulations, right? So the answer to this question is honeycombing, traction bronchiectasis, interstitial fibrosis, peripheral septal thickenings, ground glass opacities, and reticulations. So it is B, C, and E. Multiple nodular opacities. Multiple nodular opacities is the characteristic features of metastasis, which is also called as the canon ball metastasis or cotton ball metastasis. Yes or no? Or if it is a single nodule, we call it a solitary pulmonary nodule, or we can also call it as pulmonary hamartoma. Do you remember this one? Pulmonary hamartoma. I think I told you what is this appearance? Popcorn, 
calcification. Remember, if you did not uh, note it down before, you write it down now. Pulmonary hamartoma, it has got a classical appearance called as popcorn calcification. It is a modular, it is a nodular density, okay? Right? Tuberculoma, yes, it is a classical feature of the solitary pulmonary nodule, which is also called as satellite lesion. If you can understand the differences between these terms, I think you have got most of your fill in the blanks correct as well. But uh, people who ever got the complete marks, please question yourselves, how did you get these answers from? If you got it by knowledge, yes, it is correct. Uh, you are doing a very, very good job and proceed. But if you are trying to look down into the books and trying to write down the answers, maybe I think these are the points where you have to stress yourselves a lot. Yes? Okay, pulmonary hamartoma is a popcorn calcification. Well, maybe for Indian guys, I can tell you one another classical example here. Capsule, okay, with the capsule, uh, let us say it is the water lily within water lily sign or flower sign flower within a capsule okay flower within a capsule is a characteristic feature of okay remember this one as well okay this is a very characteristic feature uh, but uh, Generally, no, I did not add this uh, information because it may not be necessary for you in the theory. But for competitive examination purposes, you have to remember this one. See, uh, this is a very classical disease, hydatic disease, which is actually happening because of, okay, what is the parasite that causes hydatic disease? Anybody? Hydatid worm. Doesn't it have a scientific name? Does it have a scientific name? Is it called as hydatidosis? Type one? What is the parasite? What is the name of the parasite? What is the name of the parasite that causes hydatid disease? Echinococcus granulosus. Yes, not some granulosus. Okay, Pratishta, it is Echinococcus granulosus. Yes, intermediate host is uh, sheep and dogs. Okay, it might be happening because of uh, dog meat consumption or it can be actually happening because of uh, occupational exposure, right? So uh, those people will actually have a water lily sign, okay? A cyst present down inside, okay? A cyst present down inside the lungs, which looks like a water lily, okay? Simple. The lily, the flower floats in water and Echinococcus granulosus, this tapeworm actually also flows in water. Okay, let me show out the picture. Maybe you can remember that one, but for competitive exams, yes, this is a very classical question to be asked. Mm. The same thing, it can also be seen, water lily sign on the liver also, yes, hydatid cyst, okay? It is both seen in lungs and liver, do not forget it, okay? It is uh, more like a lily flower floating up in the water. It can happen in the lungs and liver. Let me show you. Maybe you can save that image. Here. Look at this picture. You can appreciate there is a big cyst inside the right lung. Okay, big cyst inside the right lung where there is some kind of, a, you know, uh, marking. Two images I sent you. So this is actually the water lily sign, okay, which is a characteristic feature of hydatid disease. 
hydratosis. Okay. And then it can also happen down in the liver. In the liver also, it looks like the same as well. Okay, in liver also, it looks like the same as well. Uh, you can see water lily sign asked on liver and lungs. Both of them will actually look like the same thing. Both of them will look like, uh, you know, uh, the water lily sign itself. Water lily sign on the liver and water lily sign on the lungs. Both of them are hydratic disease itself. The causative organism is dog tape warm. The scientific name is Echinococcus granulosis. Okay. Right. Maybe this is a very classical question for uh, most of the Indian guys, right? Okay, here, uh, this is a uh, very characteristic. Do not ignore metastasis of the lungs. Metastasis due to lymphatic spread shows radiographic features such as, okay? Metastasis due to lungs actually shows down the Kerlis lines, okay? Kerlis lines, interstitial changes then pleural effusions and fluid in the fissures. This is a very, very characteristic feature, okay? It is a very characteristic feature. The answer to this question is only uh, both A and B, okay? Not A and C, generally metastasis due to lymphatic spread do not show multiple discrete nodules and lymphadenopathy, no, it does not. It shows pleural effusions and fluid in the fissures because lymphatics open down into the pleural cavity so they will be showing up of fluid in the fissures. And while they are opening down into fluid, uh, while they are opening down into the pleural cavity, how they are actually, they are actually also going to form the KD lines as well. And interstitium, the connective tissue is the place where the lymphatic channels are present. So I think this is the answer. If you know the anatomy also, you can answer this question. Even if you know the, you know, the characteristic feature is also, uh, Yeah, Aman, yes, you are correct. Multiple discrete nodules is in hematogenous spread. That is correct, okay? But those are the people actually, yes, they are the ones who is showing lymphadenopathy. That is true, okay? Right, so uh, the answer can be cracked down from anatomy or can be cracked down from physiology. Both, yes, okay, metastasis. Due to lymphatic spread shows a radiographic features of Kerry lines and interstitial changes. Pleural effusions are fluid in the fissures. This is a classical example. Okay, next. Radiographic signs of atelectasis. Do not ever forget what is the difference between obstructive atelectasis, okay, obstructive pneumonias, pneumonectomy, and pleural effusions. Do not forget the differences of the each and condition that is related down to the opacified hemithorax, okay? It is always, always asked as a four marks question. And so many MCQs can be coming down from this one. Atelectasis, okay, maybe hopefully, let us say the assignment of respiratory cardiovascular system will eventually might have this question. Read the opacified hemithorax chapter very well, okay? So what exactly will the atelectasis show? Atelectasis will be showing up ipsilateral tracheal deviation and mediastinal shift, and also will be showing the ipsilateral elevation of the hemidiaphragm. Okay, if a problem is present down, if let us say if the left upper lobe has been collapsed, uh, sorry, no, left lower lobe has been collapsed, the trachea will be deviated down into the left side and the whole contents of the mediastinum and the heart will also be eventually pulled down to the left side and the left side hemidiaphragm will be elevated. This is a characteristic feature of left-sided lower lobar atelectasis. So atelectasis will have ipsilateral tracheal deviation and mediastinal shift along with elevation of the ipsilateral hemidiaphragm. Contralateral tracheal deviation and mediastinal shift is a characteristic feature of pleural effusions and pneumothorax. Uh, I think last time somebody has asking me about this question, sir, how can we recognize, how can, what is the easiest way to remember them? 
the easiest way to remember them is nothing but learning the concept well okay there is no such easy way here if you have understood the concepts of atelectasis what is how it is happening what is the process of progression if you know about that one yes you apply that concept and that is how you are actually solving this question if not yes there are more likely to be mistaken yes is there any confusion is there for any guys who still have a confusion with this one who still do not understand pleural effusion pneumothorax and atelectasis yes Yes, no. Okay. I'll take it as a no then. All right. Okay, this one uh, is. Okay, this one is a. Uh, this is the question that has been uh, posed wrong here. Okay, the answer was uh, not correct. Uh, but uh, I, let me correct this one here. The image is the one that is actually showing up as two transverse parallel densities. Okay, two parallel densities, like streak like densities, which is parallel to the hemidiaphragm. This is a characteristic feature of, okay, tell me, most of the people tell me what is the answer to this question? What is the answer to this question? Why Archana thinks it is A? Yes, it is atelectasis. Okay, all the things I gave you are atelectasis. But which atelectasis? It is discoid atelectasis. Remember, discoid atelectasis is the one that is actually being parallel to the hemidiaphragm, but compressive atelectasis will be going down perpendicular to it, right? So rounded atelectasis is entirely different, okay? So the answer to this question is discoid atelectasis, okay? Most of the people got it correct, got it correct, okay? I have seen, yes, most of the people have chosen B. This is a classical example, okay? Uh, right? Try to learn the differences between rounded atelectasis, discoid atelectasis, and compressive atelectasis together. Okay. Uh, this can be asked down as an image. Most of the times, this will be asked down as an image. Okay. Right. The last question All are the causes of transudative pleural effusion. I have seen most of the people have you got this wrong. What is the answer to this question here? Transudative pleural effusion will be happening because of lymphoid obstruction. Okay, but the difference between the you know difference between the oncotic pressure and the osmolarity is actually the one that is called as an exudative. Okay. Lymphoid obstruction is a transudative. The other one is exudative. All these other conditions that is actually happening here is the exudative things, okay? Right? Right, so lymphoid obstruction. So I think that's it. But uh, however, uh, I am seeing here, whoever the people that sat down in this session, yes, you guys have done, yes, good performance. Yes, Brenda, I guess you have already known the, known your marks, right? Did you guys find out what marks you have achieved? Yes, no? Right, most of the people, I think they know their mistakes and they also know about their marks. I think all the people who are sitting, I think they got 10%. Yes or no? Most of the people here, at least 95% of the people who sat in this session, has got 20 marks, I guess. Right? So I want to ask this question. Were you guys looking into the books and writing down the answers or were you, did you really do it yourselves?
why there is no response? Were you doing without books or with the books? <laughs> okay, nice. Okay, if you are doing without the slides, that is fine. Okay. Uh, but if you are doing with the books also, it's fine. But still make sure that you learn these concepts very well. Okay. These are the most important concepts that has to be by hearted. Uh, by hearted in the sense, okay, you have to understand the concept. Unless you understand the concept, you will not be able to answer this one. Okay, let's do the fill in the blanks. I'll complete down it very fast. Simple questions, they are not difficult at all. Maybe let's see here. One thing. See, I got like, uh, you know, Okay, whoever got 19 has got 20 marks because we are going to add one mark here. Let me see, let me see. You see here? Well, you see almost, almost 70 people, okay? Almost 70 people scored well. Uh, the people, 35 people almost, see? 35 people has almost got 10 percent scores. So congratulations, you guys did a very awesome job. OK, it's so good. I'm so happy that you guys are reading. But if you have been deceiving me and if you have been doing down without with the books or something like that, I think I have I better suggest you that you pay more attention and read two or three times. OK, right. All the people who ever got better marks, congratulations. But still do not forget to read every day. OK. These concepts will go vague in few days. By the end of this semester comes over, you will forget most of the concepts of radiology. Doesn't matter how interesting the classes are. Okay, so perfect revision is necessary. Let's take this one. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, a pattern of interstitial lung disease that shows both lines and dots. What is it? Reticular nodular pattern. Simple. Do not write the answer to this question, you know, as uh, a, you know, let me see, I think what exactly you guys are writing here. Uh, there is a lot of uh, confusion here. You guys have been writing down as the reticular nodular pattern of interstitial lung disease, reticular nodular disease. There is no such thing called as reticular nodular disease. Okay, there is only a pattern that is called as reticular nodular pattern. There is a disease that is called as interstitial disease. Okay, but uh, which actually shows up reticular nodular pattern. Either you cannot see, uh, let me actually tell you how to crack such kind of questions uh, following for the fill in the blanks. A disease is generally having two or more basic lesions together okay two or more basic lesions together such kind of definition will be usually a disease which means to say i'm asking you to write the name of a disease but you see here here i'm just asking about the lines and dots a hyperdensity i'm just talking only about a single basic lesion okay either a hyperdensity or a hypodensity such one is actually forming down a pattern. When I'm usually asking about a pattern, you should be writing about the basic radiographic observation by definition. Okay, so whoever wrote interstitial disease here, generally, you know, you got the concept wrong because this is an interstitial disease, but this pattern is not interstitial disease. This pattern is reticular nodular pattern. You know it interstitial because you are observing it a pattern of reticulations and nodulations together. That is how you were able to make out the diagnosis as interstitial disease. OK, so there is a difference of writing down the answer to a question that comes down with pattern. And there is an answer to the question uh, to the one with the disease. Look at the question correctly and try to say which one you are opted to write because most of the people made this mistake 
However, I gave you marks for the time being, but in main exam, that won't happen, okay? See, for example, uh, okay, I will deal about this question in the last, um, but we will deal the others later on first because they will be completing fast. Here, you see here, a homogeneous radio opacity with indistinct margins with a pulmonary lobe or a segment as the alveoli are filled up with pus, fluid, blood cells, and protein is called as. What is this called as? See, I am asking only about a single basic lesion, a homogeneous radio opacity, which means to say, am I looking for a pattern or am I looking for a disease? Does this question indicate, am I looking for a disease diagnosis or I'm looking for a pattern? Right, so pattern. So the answer to this question will become consolidation or opacification, but it is not pneumonia, okay? It is not pneumonia. People who have wrote pneumonia, yes, your answer is absolutely correct. The, sorry, your diagnosis is absolutely correct. But how did you actually recognize it as a pneumonia? You recognized it as a pneumonia because you were able to find out an opacificated area. You were able to find out a consolidated area. That's the reason you came to know how about pneumonia, right? So a thing, whenever I'm trying to ask about a pattern, you will be asked about a single homogeneous density or something like that. But when I'm trying to ask about a disease, I will be including two or more radiographic features together. So it means to say, I am trying to ask you about the diagnosis. There is a difference between two of them, okay? Do not forget uh, about this classification. Even when you are trying to read down the interpretation of chest radiograph images, okay, reports, radiological reports, you generally, you cannot, you, if you write the pattern, Pattern does not suggest any kind of diagnosis. Two kind, two or three patterns coming together will suggest you a diagnosis, okay? A single pattern is a basic lesion, something like calcification, something like a cyst, something like a bulla, something like a, uh, you know, reticulous, reticulation, something like nodules, something like a mass, something like a cavity, something like an abscess. These are all basic lesions. Okay, those basic lesions actually are the patterns. But cavitation along with the fibrosis, along with reticulations, yes, together, it, together, all these patterns are suggesting me a diagnosis towards interstitial lung diseases or towards tuberculosis. Did you understand the difference? One pattern, one basic lesion, usually I'm asking you to write about a pattern. Two or three patterns together, I'm asking you to write about a disease. So answer is for the time being, the people whoever has wrote the answer to this question, pneumonia, along with the answer as patchy opacification, yes, I gave you marks, but people who wrote pneumonia, no, I did not. Because I'm not asking you about pneumonia. Okay. The next one, you see, that's the same thing here. Multiple, two large discrete nodules that appears in the lung, result of hematogenous spread. See, I'm asking about two radiographic together. It means to say, uh, I'm oh, sorry, it is, I, I'm asking a going about a single pattern here. Two or more large discrete nodules that appears in the lung, which is happening because of hematogenous spread. Again, it is a pattern. So what is the pattern called? The pattern is obviously called as a cannonball metastasis. Okay, cannonball metastasis. That is the correct answer to this question. Uh, most of the people, yes, uh, you have got uh, correct, but uh, so many people have got this answer wrong. They have been writing miliary TB, solitary pulmonary nodule. I don't know, see, most people wrote pneumonia, pneumonia, pneumonia. Right? Patchy opacities, no, this is not a patchy opacities. Yes, most of the people who wrote this answer, I think you have misinterpreting your symptoms, your patterns, okay? Revise those patterns. I guess most of the people, you know, sitting down here, I think they got the answer correct. Right, next one.
Okay, this is fairly a very, very classical image. Uh, you see here, I am looking at the lines that are running the parallel uh, perpendicular to the plural space. Okay, perpendicular to the plural line. Okay, and which is actually the visceral vascular markings seen in the periphery at the lung basis. So such kind of lines are generally called as the curly B lines. Most of the people, yes, you got it correct. Okay, here I am looking at a very, very classical picture of a honeycombing. Okay, this is a classical picture of honeycombing. You see here, uh, the arrows in the following images are showing up patterns. I'm always asking you about a pattern. So people, whoever wrote the answer to this one as pulmonary edema, whoever wrote this one as interstitial pneumonia, no, you will not, your answers will be gone wrong. This is a pattern. Whenever an arrow is pointed, yes, I'm asking you to recognize a single radiographic feature. Did you understand right now what exactly where the arrows are pointing? Why do we use arrows? The arrows are used to you to mark down the radiographic features. Okay. So the answer to this question here is interstitial uh, lung disease, the diagnosis. The pattern you are looking at is a typical pattern of honeycombing. Okay, the last one here, this one, so many people got it wrong. So many people got it wrong, but the diagnosis was correct. So eventually I gave you the marks for that one. This is actually not a tuberculosis gone focus lesion to be exact, but this is a solitary pulmonary nodule or a satellite lesion, a tuberculoma. That's what I'm uh, telling Benedict. Yes. See, a disease will have two or more radiographic patterns. Okay. When in a sentence, if you read, okay, when in a sentence, if you read, okay, a patient showing up, okay, a patient showing up uh, fluid in the fissures pulmonary fibrosis changes along with atelectasis and a cavitation. See all the basic lesions, two or three patterns I am including together. So in a sentence, I will be asking you about a disease. Okay. Which means to say I am asking you to write down a disease. Yes, Benedict, did you understand? And let us say if I'm asking you to define a cavity, okay, a thin walled, okay, a thin walled opacity with the central radiolucency. What is it? It's a basic lesion. I'm just talking only hyperdensity and hypodensity. I'm just talking about a single lesion. I'm, I'm talking about a single basic lesion. So what is it? A thin wall with a central hypolucency cavity. So it is a pattern, right? Cavity is a pattern. It's a basic lesion. So when I'm asking about a single hypodensity, it will be having two or more basic lesions. But a disease will have two or more basic patterns. Okay. Diseases are a mixture of patterns where the lesions are the single hypodensity or hyperdensity. That is how you are supposed to know. Okay. But in images, we will be asking directly without the arrows and say, what is the diagnosis of this image? Something like the pulmonary alveolar edema. There is no arrow in that question, right? Benedict, yes, your, is your question answer clear? See, when I gave an image about the butterfly, black wings appearance, right? Black wings appearance is actually the interstitial mnemonic pattern, right? Interstitial pneumonia, uh, mnemonic pattern with the very high hazard densities, right? So multiple fluffy densities that are uh, going along. So we are looking at the heart shadow on the other things all together, right? So different two or three patterns have been present there. 
So, which means to say, I gave you that image without the arrows, which means to say, I'm asking you to write down about the disease. But if I am asking you, uh, actually pointing down more specifically arrows and asking you particular, which means to say, I'm asking you about some kind of a pattern. Okay. So in this image, actually, it is looking down. This one is specifically a solitary pulmonary nodule. This is a solitary pulmonary nodule or a satellite lesion. Yes, for time's sake, yes, you can also interpret down as a GONS lesion. That is true. But GONS lesion, uh, but GONS lesion is generally, it's not like that. Very few people has written down this one as a solitary pulmonary nodule. Yes, I guess uh, Benedict is only the guy, I think, who has written that answer. Let me check. I don't know if I can remember. Yes, very, very few people has written as a solitary pulmonary nodules. And only one person has written down as satellite lesion. Okay. But GONS complex, yes, this can be also GONS complex. But this is not usually GONS complex where you will be confusing yourselves. GONS complex will be much more hazy than this one irregular border but this one does not have irregular border but this one has a regular border so the more specific cancer will be a solitary pulmonary nodule okay but that's fine i know uh, it's okay don't worry about that one the differential diagnosis is gone's focus of on solitary pulmonary nodule and tuberculoma that is correct don't worry okay this one is very very simple this patient is actually showing up a stage two sarcoidosis a known patient with stage one sarcoidosis actually has to show bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy with right paratracheal lymphadenopathy with bilateral reticulonodular pattern simple okay that is a characteristic feature of classical stage two sarcoidosis you have to buy hard that there is no other way. Most of the people, yes, also has got this answer correct. OK. But you guys, you know, you guys are making a lot of spelling mistakes. God save you guys. Don't make spelling mistakes. OK, that is so silly. You are in a med school and you are not liable to. You might you can have a dirty handwriting but you cannot have a spelling mistakes and grammatical errors okay if you have a dirty handwriting yeah that's i appreciate it because the doctor should have dirty handwriting there is no other reason for that <laughs> okay they this one the next one a calcified tuberculous granuloma and calcified mediastinal lymph node in a tb patient most of you people has got this wrong. I don't know why there was a confusion for you guys. See, a hazy density, a hazy density that is coming down and it is showing up as a granulomatous lesion in the right upper lobe without calcification, but with only lymphadenopathy and enlarged lymph node with a granuloma inside the upper lobes is generally a characteristic feature of tuberculosis, primary tuberculosis, which can be recognized by a GONS lesion. But you see here, this one is a calcified tuberculosis granuloma and a calcified mediastinal lymph node. A calcified tuberculosis granuloma and a calcified mediastinal lymph node is actually called as a Ranke's complex. Okay. So people who has written it as GONS complex also, yes, I gave you because uh, uh, I never taught you about the GONS complex. GONS complex is generally is not calcification. It is just granuloma along with a hilar lymph node. Okay, it is a GONS complex, but this can be actually when there is calcification, you generally call it as a Ranke's complex or a primary complex. Very few people has got this answer correct. Please read about tuberculosis more detail. Okay, the differences between a GONS lesion, GONS focus and GONS lesion are together the same. Okay, but GONS complex and primary complex are not the same. GONS focus and Simon focus are not the same. Okay, 
they these are the terms which we you will be actually having a lot of confusion remember whenever there is a calcification of the tubercular gons focus and along with enlarged lymph node that eventually gets calcified both of them should have calcifications that is the characteristic feature of a rankis complex which is a primary complex which actually suggests you that the patient has been suffering from reactivation of tb did you understand this one it is the characteristic feature of secondary tuberculosis healed tuberculosis okay healed tuberculosis generally it is a healed tuberculosis and eventually that will reactivate okay this is a characteristic feature of secondary tuberculosis right gons focus primary tuberculosis all right okay the complications of secondary pulmonary tuberculosis yes you have got so many things to write uh, i guess one person only one person has write down the perfect answer what i have been looking for yes broncholithiasis fibrosis calcifications pleural effusions pneumothorax okay bronchiectasis traction bronchiectasis atelectasis all of them comes down into it okay only one person wrote what the answer i am technically looking for it is broncholithiasis broncholithiasis is a characteristic a very very high end complication of secondary pulmonary tuberculosis okay it is happening as a clinical complication in both the tb patients and histoplasmosis patients as well okay it is called as broncholithiasis calcified and stone formations inside the bronchus broncholithiasis but yes you can have a big choice of complications that you can write here complications are generally fibrosis cavitations pleural effusion tracheal bronchiectasis pneumothorax cavitations empyemas all of the things you can write a lot been list okay but uh, complications of secondary pulmonary tuberculosis is not uh, you know gons focus and rank is complex okay don't write it that way complications are entirely different basic lesions okay i think there should be no confusion to this question right and i think there is only one question left here most of the people you know i guess could have gone wrong with these questions if i haven't given down you the hints um uh, I wanted to ask you one question where did you guys find these answers which is actually called as you know um, what do you say now let me check what the answer they you you guys wrote temporary pacemaker permanent venous transfer pacemakers and you have been rewriting down as uh, you know pacemaker with two leads whoever the people has written down this the pacemaker with the two leads where did you guys get these answers from have you been looking down in google and tell, telling that okay uh, what are the types of pacemaker since you know this is a pacemaker you wanted to know my question is that you just recognize this structure this is an is an artificial cardiac pacemaker device okay you can also call it as implantable cardioverter defibrillator but that is a very classical name whoever the people has wrote implantable cardioverter defibrillator did you learn what is cardioversion and what is defibrillation if you understood that one and if you wrote this answer i am so happy with you because i think while we are dealing about uh, a condition in cardiovascular system i have been talking about a condition do you remember what is this condition where you actually install this one cardiac pacemaker devices okay where do you, what is the condition that actually has got an indication for uh, you know installment of a cardiac pacemaker device Do you remember that? Anybody can you remember? Mm. 
No, I'm asking about the condition. Which condition? The disease name. What do we call that condition? Okay, low conductions. Okay, SA node does not function properly. What do you call that conditions as? Arrhythmias, right? Or you also call them as? Fibrillation disorders, right? Tell me one of the name of the fibrillation disorders or arithmetic cardiac arrhythmias. One example, one classical example that you anybody should have been known. Bradycardia is a symptom, Reshma. Not every patient with bradycardia usually you have to go for, uh, you know, uh, cardiac pacemaker installation. No, bradycardia, maybe you can actually go for defibrillation, but that is not the one, okay? If you are saying bradycardia, arrhythmia, arrhythmias are the patients or the fibrillation patients are the one that will be having tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia patients. They will be having heart rate. They will be having, uh, uh, you know, something around like 200, uh, you know, uh, heartbeats. So maybe technically, if you are thinking about bradycardia and tachycardia, yes, both of the conditions, yes, you will be doing defibrillation. But there is a condition, I think, uh, when I was discussing down in the class, I told you the name of the condition where we usually do it. Okay. Benedict. Remember this name? Anybody remember this name? What is the full form of this name? I have just typed WPW syndrome. What is this WPW syndrome? Yes, Wolf Parkinson's white syndrome, okay? Which is a cardiac arrhythmic disorders uh, where you will be generally prescribed down a placement of an artificial cardiac pacemaker device or an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. That is fine. See, whenever, what is actually cardioversion is that, okay, whenever the heart is not responding down to the impulses, okay? You will be doing a procedure called as cardioversion. Cardioversion is that you are going to give down the thrust or the electrical impulses indirectly to the chest, and then which will eventually activate uh, the cardiac pacemaker. Okay, what is the cardiac pacemaker? The cardiac pacemaker is nothing but your sinoauricular node. Okay, sinoauricular node. So that one is actually called such kind of technique is actually called as cardioversion. Uh, sorry, this kind of technique is actually called as defibrillation. Cardioversion in the sense, okay, you are looking down at the conduction system hole, okay, also looking at the bundle of this uh, parking you fibers and taking them together. If it might be happening because of the bundle branch blocks, okay, we will be doing down a technique called as cardioversion. So these devices are generally implanted inside the pectoralis major muscle and they will be doing down this cardioversion along with defibrillation. Okay, both techniques, cardioversion can be also done, defibrillation also can be done. So that's the reason they are called as artificial cardiac pacemaker devices. The other name is, okay, implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Yes, there are so many types of these ones, but do not write the answer to this question as pacemaker because our heart already has got a pacemaker. The failure of that pacemaker, yes, will eventually get down an indication of installation of this device. Okay, yes. <clears throat> Is there any confusion here? The second one, most of the people actually has got this one as, uh, you know, almost correct, 
almost correct, but uh, you did not technically get it correct. Uh, you know, this is not actually called as endobronchial tube. No, there is nothing a thing that is called as endobronchial tube. It is actually called as endotracheal intubation, ET tube. Okay, this is actually called as an ET tube, ET tube. Okay, but there is a one thing that you have to understand from this question, actually, my intention was you to actually differentiate the different types of ET tubes and different indications of ET tubes. Because if you know this question answer here, you will be also be able to answer this question down here. Because even this patient has got an ET tube inside. ET tube is an endotracheal intubation, generally used down to treat down a condition of a delectasis, aspiration, okay, anesthesia patient post surgery, okay any kind of a person who has got collapsed lungs okay has coming down up with a severe problem of ARDS ventilation disorders or other things yes we will be giving down an ET tube artificial respiration we will be giving down it by VM mask okay ventilatory mask and how do we actually differentiate it from a tracheostomy tube is that okay a tracheostomy tube is shot and it will be given down from the cricothyroid cartilage. Okay. You make a section along the cricothyroid cartilage and that is where you are entering down the trachea. So that is an, uh, you know, tracheostomy tube, which is much more shorter than this. Okay. It will be reaching only to the first three cricoid cartilages only. But ET tube will be inserted from the mouth, okay? ET tube will be inserted from the mouth and it will reach up to the angle of the carina, okay? One centimeter above the carina is the placement of an ET tube, okay? Generally, radiographic x-rays are the ones that are actually performed to observe the correct placement of an ET tube and a tracheostomy tube, okay? And tracheostomy tube will generally will not look like this because it is short and the entry point is from the cricothyroid cartilage, right? It is from the neck, but ET tube will be entering down from the mouth. Okay, the placement of an ET tube is just about the level, one centimeter above the level of carinal angle. ET tube, one to three cricoid cartilages, that's the level you find out. Okay, so both are different. But for the time sake, yes, people have written, whoever written as, you know, endotracheal intubation, endobronchial intubation. Yes, I have given down the marks, but that's not specific, okay? Make sure that you do not make a mistake about this one later on. Yes, any confusion? Did you understand? What is the difference between a tracheostomy and an ET? Both of them are actually the maneuvers of artificial ventilation as well. Both of them are same. Both of them does the same function. But ET tube is actually given down to a person who cannot breathe by himself. Tracheostomy is a procedure done to the people who can breathe by themselves. Okay, two different indications. Both of them actually do the same purpose of doing the respiration. Okay. Right. And uh, the next one here, most of the people also actually wrote a very, very vague answer. This is actually a chest compression tube, chest drainage tube, we call it as orthoracotomy tube. Okay. Orthoracotomy chest drainage tube. Okay. Right. This one is a chest drainage tube, which is generally done for the decompression of the pleural effusions. Generally done for the decompression of the pleural effusion, extraction of the pleural effusion after you have extracted down, uh, after you have done thoracentesis procedure, you will be placing down a tube inside so that the collapsed lung and all the fluid that has been accumulated later on can be collected back. Okay, so this is a chest drainage tube. Yes, it will be given down in, uh, you know, uh, in all the 
uh, clinical conditions like trauma, pneumothorax, uh, pleural effusions, yes, you can actually uh, take this one here. Okay. So uh, I think almost uh, that's it. I think we have done. Okay. The difference between the catheter and a tube, a tube is a tube is wider and its borders are not wider as in catheter. Uh, yeah. Technically like this. Okay. Catheters are generally, uh, you know, rubber things are silicone things okay rubber things or silicone things uh catheter is a very thin tube whereas tube is much more wider and it has got wide, wider border how are we going to recognize it we are going to recognize it by the you know only one side you see here there is a hyper density that is how we're going to recognize it is as a tube or a catheter this is also a tube but you see here both of the ends are hyper hyper dense which means to say I'm looking down at a plastic tube here that is placed down inside the hemithorax. Okay, right? People who has wrote, who has written chest leads, I think, yes, you are not looking at lungs. Chest leads, okay, even here we have the chest leads. You are not looking at the problem. Okay, people who has written chest leads can, okay, maybe in the second image there is another observation. Can you guys tell me what is that another observation? If you have figured out. Tell me later on who has found it. Okay. Well, you will be laughing at me. There are pins at the vertebrae. There are pins at the vertebrae. They are dress pins. Okay. Metallic clips. Okay, it could actually happen because of uh, any previous surgery or it can be happening because of a dress. I don't know. Okay, we cannot technically differentiate. I think most probably it can be the suture and clips. But actually what I'm seeing here is a nasogastric tube as well. That's what it is. Okay, I'm looking at a nasogastric tube that has been placed. Okay, Riles catheter. Okay. Metallic clips are there. Yes, and there is an asogastric tube, Riles tube. Okay. And this third image, actually, the person has also got the endotracheal intubation and the chest drainage tube. Okay. Left lung is not clear. Yeah, that, that, that is what I'm saying, right? Most of the times, this is indicated for atelectasis patients. Okay. Right. The answer to this question, okay, pneumothorax. Okay, what are the radiographic features of pneumothorax? Okay, there is the transverse visceral pleural line. Okay, white pleural line, and you will be having clear rib shadows with absent lung markings. Okay, both the arrows suggest that this is the white visceral pleural line, rung retracted towards the hilum, and this is the absent rib clear shadows. Okay, rib shadows are quite clear. Okay, clear rib shadow is the correct answer. And it is suggesting a diagnosis of generally when I'm asking when see when arrows are pointed, it is a very, very good idea to write down the side. OK, this one. Yes, of course, it is pneumothorax. You have got answer correct and marks correct for the pneumothorax. But in profession, you can't say it as a pneumothorax. You can you have to say it as a right sided pneumothorax. OK, do not ignore the sides of the patient as well. OK. Yes, I know it is pneumothorax. Yes, you guys are correct. But the correct way of writing it will be, you know, right sided pneumothorax, which is, you know, fairly a good way. So that I will know if even if I'm looking down at the left lung, you are indicating me, no, there is no problem down in the left lung. You just look at the right lung. That is what you will do it. Generally, write down the sides, which is fairly better. Okay. Next, uh, I think one uh, one question I missed. I don't know. Right, okay. You see here, A, dissecting along the muscular bundles, characteristic comb-like structure, striated appearance, which means to say I'm asking for a pattern, and the pattern is subcutaneous emphysema. Yes, most of you people got it correct. That's fine. The visualized radiograph is actually showing up a diagnosis of, okay, this one is, what is this? Okay, it, this one do not have the fifth rib. Okay, this is a condition of pneumonectomy, obviously. 
but the better answer will be you know right sided pneumonectomy or right sided hemithorax due to pneumonectomy opacified right hemithorax due to pneumonectomy that is also correct answer pneumonectomy is correct answer but better